Gentlemen, I represent the University of the Virgin Islands, a land-grant university, and it has skin in the game, as do the territory's small-scale producers who benefit from fully staffed agencies. Not only were stakeholders entirely cut out of this process, they were blindsided by the announcement from USDA last August. And to date, the actual benefits to ag research or an economic analysis of this proposal have not been conveyed. ERS and NIFA are already understaffed well below their appropriated staffing levels. Instead of pushing forward a proposal that will only exacerbate staff losses, USDA should be working to adequately staff these agencies. The agency is still catching up from a 35-day shutdown. Further reducing staff only weakens the agency's ability to operate or respond to future events. Staff losses directly translate into a loss of critical institutional knowledge and decrease capacity to implement the very programs we just authorized in the 2018 Farm Bill. This proposal will undermine the integrity of these agencies and their ability to operate and it was followed by a FY20 budget request, which proposed cutting the number of ERS employees in half. This relocation announcement seems to me like a step towards an overall goal of staff reduction. Relocation will limit the agency's ability to coordinate and cooperate with other federal entities based in the national capital region, such as other federal departments, the National Academies, the National Science Foundation. Agriculture research does not take place in a vacuum, and modern science is complex and interdisciplinary. We should be encouraging collaboration, not isolating agencies. In consultation with the ranking member and pursuant to Rule 11E, I want to make members of the subcommittee aware that other members of the full Agriculture Committee may join us today. With that, I will recognize the ranking member, the distinguished gentleman from Florida, Mr. Dunn, for any opening remarks he'd like to make. Thank you very much, Chairwoman Plaskett. Uh, this subcommittee has jurisdiction over biotechnology, pesticide regulation, plant uh, pest and disease programs, all policy areas that will have a profound impact on the future of American agriculture. And while I'm excited the committee's holding its first hearing, it absolutely baffles me that our first topic is USDA office relocation. I don't understand the obsession with the Secretary's decision. Uh, and some of the claims that I hear from the opponents uh, to this move are making no sense to me at all. In February, Secretary Purdue sat at the table and told this committee that one of his top reasons for the relocation is talent. According to the U.S. News and World Report, four of the top five richest counties in the United States are located in the Washington, D.C. suburbs. Let's face it, it's expensive to live and raise a family in this area. And USDA cited that as a fact as one of the biggest reasons why it's difficult to attract top talent and why the department struggles to fill its positions. In response to the relocation, uh, my Democrat colleagues have introduced H.R. 1221, the Agricultural Research Integrity Act of 2019. And while billed as a response to the administration's proposed relocation, this legislation would actually require the secretary to relocate thousands of personnel to the Washington, D.C. area at enormous expense. The Agriculture Research Service has about 4,500 researchers and other staff working in facilities throughout the nation, outside Washington, D.C. If this bill were to become law, several ARS research stations throughout the country would actually close. This bill alone makes it abundantly clear that the majority's focus is on obstructing the work of the administration, except that in this case, the obstruction actually would devastate the ARS infrastructure that we've worked for decades to build throughout the United States. I am proud to have joined a letter by Ranking Member Mike Conaway and Congresswoman Vicki Hartzler and signed by every Republican member on the House Agricultural Committee in support of the Secretary's decision. Additionally, there are several other letters signed by both Democrat and Republican members in Congress in support of the relocation. Contrary to the tone that we will hear today, Secretary Purdue has broad support to move forward with this uh, relocation. I recognize that Congress must exercise its oversight authority, and I am supportive of an honest and thoughtful conversation about the direction that USDA agricultural research programs take. However, it is not the purpose of this hearing. 
In this Congress, we've consistently seen that if the President and his team propose something, the majority will automatically oppose it. And this topic seldom seems to matter. Instead of tackling real issues that impact the true stakeholders of USDA, it is unfortunate that some of our colleagues continue to play politics. The Secretary has laid out a measured and deliberate plan for the relocation, has taken steps to affect, help, help the affected employees, and I am confident of his execution. Uh, this is a fight that exists only in Washington, D.C. Beltway bubble and in ivory towers across the country. When I talk to folks back home, most everybody agrees that the farther you are away from Washington, D.C., the better off you are. I look forward to moving on to the real issues that face American agriculture. Madam uh, Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, the chair, as chair, I would request that other members submit their opening statements for the record so that the witnesses may begin their testimony to ensure that there's ample time for questions. And I just want to make everyone aware that under the rules of the committee, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional material and supplementary written responses from the witnesses to any questions posed by a member. Um, I'd like to welcome all of our witnesses. Thank you for being here today. At this time, I'll introduce our first witness, Dr. Jack Payne. Dr. Payne is a Senior Vice President for Agriculture and Natural Resources at the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida. Um, Mr. Yoho, is that near you? I thought so. <laughs> I know it, I know it. The second witness is Dr. William Tracy. Dr. Tracy is a professor of agronomy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And we will also hear from Ms. Elizabeth Brownlee. Ms. Brownlee is the owner and operator of Nightfall <coughs> Farm, a diversified livestock operation in Crothersville, Indiana. We'll now proceed to hearing the testimony. You will each have five minutes. When one minute is left, the light that you see will turn yellow as a signal for you to start wrapping up your testimony, all right? Um, Dr. Payne, please begin when you are ready. of UF's Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, or what we call UF IFAS. However, I come before you on behalf of myself. I am not representing the University of Florida. Our nation's winter and fruit and vegetable supply depends on the support of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture and the Economic Research Service for UF IFAS's innovation and discovery. Florida farmers, fishers, foresters, and ranchers succeed in part because of what NIFA and ERS do. And they succeed because of where NIFA and ERS do it. Right here, not 600 or 1,000 miles from here. Relocation means NIFA moves NIFA away from its primary partners, federal science agencies, leading scientists, policymakers, and experts. The move risks impeding NIFA's core mission to be a vital contributor to science policy decision-making, and an integral part of the federal effort to address the most pressing local and global agricultural problems of our day. We've solved the easy problems in agriculture. In today's world, we're working on complex challenges that require multiple decisions, disciplines working together on solutions. You get the best science when you can bring different disciplines together to examine a problem from many angles. The federal government can incentivize this interdisciplinary work by combining funding from multiple agencies. Bringing diverse scientific expertise together is extremely difficult, even among departments that share a building at the University of Florida. It would be so much harder if those departments were in different states. The nation's capital is the best place to address the nation's agricultural research needs. There's no better place better for NIFA to coordinate with other Funding agencies call attention to the national need for more agricultural research and to meet with representatives of what its website calls its chief partner, the nation's land-grant universities. Farmers are among the ultimate beneficiaries of NIFA-funded science. 
USDA has an efficient network of land-grant university extension agents and research stations, over 500 of them, to provide information to those farmers in their communities and across the country. It's a proven model that can instantaneously disperse vital scientific discoveries and new methods to farmers who can use it. To say ERS and NIFA need to be geographically closer to farmers is to miss how effective this network is in delivering innovation to farmers nationwide. Furthermore, NIFA and ERS have other important customers, USDA, land grants, Congress, and other federal science agencies such as NIH and NSF. Relocation would put these agencies, the agencies farther from these more direct customers. I have dedicated most of my professional life to land-grant universities. I'm a product of one. That set me on a career course of public service, producing and disseminating science that improves people's lives. I have worked at five land-grant universities and served as the policy chair for the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities Board on Agriculture Assembly. In that role, I was able to contribute to the creation of NIFA in the 2008 Farm Bill. Today, I have the privilege of leading IFAS. We have a budget of more than $400 million to operate a College of Agricultural and Life Sciences and Extension Service with offices in all 67 Florida counties and a network of 17 research stations. All of this supports the $160 billion a year agriculture. And I see that my uh, time is almost over, so I'm going to uh, jump to my concluding paragraph. I want to uh, thank uh, Chairman Bishop of, of the Ag uh, Appropriations Committee for including bill language for the FY 2020 uh, blocking the relocation proposal. And in conclusion, I thank the committee for examining the critical role of NIFA in support of agricultural innovation and resiliency and for taking the time to hear directly from NIFA's primary partners, the scientific and educational community, and about the impact of this relocation of NIFA outside the greater Washington area. I appreciate your leadership on this important issue, and I'm pleased to respond to any questions from the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and the next witness that we have, uh, our second witness, Dr. William Tracy. Uh, you, be you may begin. You will have five minutes for a statement. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairwoman Plaskett, uh, Ranking Member Dunn, and members of the subcommittee. Um, thank you for holding this hearing. Good. Thank you for holding this hearing and thank you for inviting me to give my uh, views on, on the proposal to move NEFA and ERS. In my role here today, I am not speaking for the University of Wisconsin-Madison, but my views uh, do reflect the thoughts of many of my scientific colleagues around the country. In fact, I haven't actually talked to another scientist who actually thinks this is a good uh, move. Um, over my career, I have frequently referred to publications, as a matter of fact, Weekly, I get reports from the Economic Research Service. I use them in, my, in publications, in classrooms. And as act, an active agricultural researcher, I have had numerous uh, interactions with NIFA over the years and have received multiple uh, grants from NIFA. A um, little bit of history. When I started teaching my course in 1985, uh, I would say with pride that the U.S. produced more than 50% of the world's corn and soybeans. Today, we produce 34%. Um, this reduction is not because we're producing less. We are producing probably twice as much as we did in 1985. Um, the, the reduction is because our competitors are producing much, much more. Uh, we cannot produce our way out of this dilemma. And so in order to save family farms and improve our environment, we need more publicly funded agricultural research. Um, and I believe that the proposed relocation of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture and uh, Economic Research Service will diminish our capacity to deliver that research. Um, a couple of particular concerns. Um, I'm very much concerned that the uh, move will actually decrease um, communication with other agencies, as Dr. Payne mentioned. Um, I've received grants from the National Science Foundation as well as NIFA, um, and many of my colleagues receive grants from uh, the National Institutes of Health, Many of my agricultural colleagues receive uh, grants from the National Institute of Health, um, EPA, DOE, and other agencies. All of these agencies actually work together on agriculture. And having the key, as, as Dr. Payne said, the um, 
key partner of the land grants move away from these other groups is really gonna reduce communication. Um, I'd also say that the, um, I believe this, there's certainly some discussion about moving these agencies so they'd be closer to constituents. Uh, really, we're kind of talking about just a, group, a small group of constituents. Uh, other people, uh, this would be, um, would move further away from. I would say that often when we're talking to NEFA, we meaning uh, researchers, we often bring farmers with us and, and coming to DC, um, and then we can meet with folks from NIH, DOE, and, and places like that, as well as NIFA. Um, the one other thing that I want to mention, and I think it's already kind of popped up, um, it's, it's happening now, is, um, is perception of bias. Uh, having had the honor of serving as an AFRI grant panel man, uh, manager for, uh, for, through NIFA, um, that's the person who chooses other panelists and assigns proposals for review. I know firsthand how hard the national program leaders work to make sure there is no hint of bias or favoritism. This is not just toward research proposals from colleagues or panelists, but making sure that there's no hint of regional bias, um, ethnic uh, diversity, um, or states. So this is very, very important, and I admire the hard work that they do. I already perceive that there's um, I, I believe it's already happening, but people, uh, if we move NIFA out of D.C., um, people will perceive bias. Even if there is no favoritism, even if there is no change in how they do business, people are going to say, well, they favor Wisconsin because uh, that's where they are and that's where they're being influenced. So I really, I really think that keeping them here will actually uh, reduce that possibility of bias. And, or at least the perception of bias. And, and I think that's very important to its mission. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to our third witness, Ms. Brownlee, welcome again, and please begin. I'd like to thank Chairwoman Plaskett, Ranking Member Dunn, and members of the subcommittee for having me today. Uh, my name is Liz Brownlee, and I operate Nightfall Farm in Crothersville, Indiana, with my husband, Nate. Um, we run our business on my family's 250-acre farm, and this is our sixth season raising pastured livestock. We're members of the National Young Farmers Coalition and the Indiana Farmers Union, and um, we recently helped found the Hoosier Young Farmers Coalition. So we've been at it for three years, being a local chapter of the National Young Farmers Coalition, and I now serve as president. Uh, as a beginning farmer, so that's someone in their first 10 years farming, I'm concerned that relocating ERS and NIFA may negatively impact farmers and ranchers. Relocating ERS and NIFA will make it more challenging for farm groups to collaborate with these agencies, and it may jeopardize your ability to craft evidence-based, effective policy for farmers like me. Um, so the work these agencies do is critical to the next generation of farmers, and I want to tell you about that. So we face serious obstacles to launching and growing our farm businesses. My parents grew up on farms. They bought our farm in 1971, and with the 1980s farm crisis, they couldn't make the farm profitable. So they stopped farming the land and started renting it out, um, but I had a shot, and I started farming our land in 2014. Um, but new farmers like me, you know, we're urgently needed. The average farmer is 59, as you probably know, and um, farmers over 65 actually um, outnumber farmers under 35 by 6 to 1. That's a problem for our country. Um, but young farmers can't find and afford farmland. Student debt is crippling our ability to capitalize our businesses, um, and increasingly severe weather is making it harder to farm. So moving ERS and NIFA outside of D.C. is only going to make it more difficult for Congress and USDA to respond to these challenges. Um, and in my written testimony, I talk about the problems with relocating ERS, like uh, the urgent uh, delays to urgently needed research on climate change and farmland access. Uh, but I'd like to focus my conversation today on NIFA. So NIFA's structure and location already work effectively for farmers like me. I've worked with two other grant programs, BFRDP, that's the Beginning Farmer Rancher Development Program, and SAIR, that's the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. Uh, my husband and I worked on farms in Maine and Vermont for about five years, and then when we moved home to Indiana to farm, the BFRDP program was critical to us launching our business. Um, so we learned about grazing practices and marketing and business plan development, um, but we also learned that there were farmers from all across Indiana running thriving farm businesses, and we realized that this connection with other farmers, a chance to learn together, was critical, and we needed more of it. Farmers learn best from their peers. Um, so we launched the Hoosier Young Farmers Coalition to create a space for um, farmers to learn together with help from the BFRDP and a SARE grant. 
So in our first year, we organized over 20 events and we reached 800 Hoosier farmers. And today we host potlucks and farm tours and um, policy roundtables. And we regularly, regularly reach over 1,100 Hoosier farmers and food advocates. Um, and the BFRDP and SARE grants helped us create a space for farmers to learn and um, have a sense of camaraderie as we build Indiana's food economy. But NIFA helps make these grants a reality, but we never called NIFA to have these grants, right? We worked with local partners, our land grant universities and local SARE officials. NIFA kept working hard in DC. Moving NIFA may make it harder for stakeholders to work with them. Even if NIFA and ERS were in Indiana, I want to interact with them regularly. Um, I need to be on my farm running my business. That's why I'm a member of the Young Farmers Coalition and the National Farmers Union. They amplify my needs and my voice uh, along with other farmers from all across the country and they work with NIFA and ERS and other parts of the USDA. This equation stops working if NIFA and ERS are moved out of DC. The farm organizations that I belong to can't simply uh, up and establish a second and third office in Kansas City and Indiana. Um, that's inefficient and financially wasteful. Um, it's especially true for groups that serve underserved farmers like beginning farmers and socially disadvantaged farmers. Um, these voices, these farmers need their voices heard by Congress and USDA. It's logical to keep these agencies in Washington, D.C., where policymaking happens. Uh, it's critical for the subcommittee and other members of Congress to ensure that USDA is creating sound science, working closely with researchers like Dr. Payne and Dr. Tracy, and addressing urgent research needs that farmers like me need to be in the Farm Bill. Um, I don't need NIFA and ERS in my community. I do need NIFA and ERS working hard for me in Washington, D.C. and serving policymakers like you. Um, this work is best done in our nation's capital. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to, to testify today. Thank you very much for uh, all of our witnesses for your, your testimony. Members are going to be recognized for questioning in the order of seniority for members who were here at the start of the hearing. After that, members will be recognized in order of arrival. Uh, since we're anticipating first votes shortly, I previously discussed with the ranking member limiting questions to three minutes to ensure we get to as many members as possible, and he has agreed. Are there any objections? Hearing none, um, Mr. Yoho, you don't have any objection, do you? Oh, oh okay. Because <laughs> I, I know how you like to talk. I thought maybe you wanted your five minutes. <laughs> but I like his talking. We have great conversations. I don't want you all to think that way. Hearing none, I'll now recognize myself for three minutes. Um, I wanted to first ask any of the witnesses. In um, the press release, USDA justified the relocation proposal by saying that it wanted to move USDA resources closer to stakeholders. To date, have you ever felt that you were disadvantaged by ERS and NIFA's location in Washington, D.C.? Um, if any of you can respond to that. Do you believe that you will be disadvantaged, or, and conversely, would you be disadvantaged if ERS and NIFA move to smaller cities that are farther from you, and how? <coughs> Dr. Payne? Thank you. Uh, NIFA and ERS has never worked with uh, farmers and ranchers. There's uh, extension services in this country, almost in every county in America. There's over 500 research labs associated with 107 land-grant universities. We work with farmers and ranchers. NIFA and ERS works with us. So even if it was true, why disadvantage 49 other states and put these agencies in one state? But it, it just doesn't make sense. Today, agriculture is so interdisciplinary. I come to Washington a lot. I come to meet with my federal partner, NIFA. But I also come to meet with the Department of Defense, Department of Interior, EPA, USAID, the FARS Service, my congressional delegation, FDA. We get funding from all those agencies in interdisciplinary projects, and a lot of times NIFA is the convener. They uh, sit with us, the Assistant Secretary of REE, they bring in federal scientists from across the uh, federal spectrum to help us craft our proposals to address the interdisciplinary needs of agriculture today. Thank you. Anyone, Dr. Tracy or Ms. Brownlee? Yeah, I agree with Dr. Payne. Um, um, D.C., Washington, D.C. is one of the easiest places to get to in this country. 
Um, it's easier for me to get here than it would be to get to West Lafayette, Indiana from Madison, Wisconsin. Um, so I, I don't really buy the, uh, the distance argument. But more importantly, I do agree with Dr. Payne regarding the, um, the fact that we work with NEFA here. But we come here to talk to them and the other agencies. And if, we, if NIFA was not in, in uh, Washington, we would have to go to wherever it was to talk with them, and then we would have to come back here anyway and talk to NIH or N NSF or members of Congress. So uh, I, don't, I don't really see this as an argument. Thank you. And I'm actually running out of time, so I will now allow Mr. Dunn you, for your three minutes, sir. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I will be brief. I'd like to point a couple of statistics. Out of the 105,000 USDA employees, 97,000 of them work outside the National Capital Region. Currently, the National Institute of Food and the Agricultural and Economic Research Service are the only two USDA agencies that do not have staff presence outside of the Capital Region. Uh, I also want to highlight uh, four letters uh, supporting the Secretary's relocation effort and note that we'll be submitting these for the record. Uh, first is a letter by Ranking Member Mike Conaway and Representative Vicki Hartzler uh, and signed by myself and 29 other members, including every member of the House Ag Committee. Uh, a letter signed by the bipartisan Indiana delegation and a letter signed by the bipartisan members of Kansas and Missouri and a letter signed by the bipartisan group of members from North Carolina. And given the time and constraints today, I would like to yield the remainder of my time to my colleague from North Carolina, Mr. David Rouser. I thank my uh, friend and colleague uh, from, uh, from Florida, the uh, ranking member of the committee, subcommittee. And I want to point out that with every disagreement, there's always a, a really nice, happy compromise. And I've never known anybody uh, to not want to come to North Carolina, and certainly when they've been to North Carolina in the Research Triangle area, uh, they don't want to leave. And the statistics uh, show that in terms of the population growth there. Uh, as most folks know, the Triangle area is one of the areas under consideration for the relocation of both. It's only a four and a half hour drive from D.C. Our flight, uh, RD Air, RDU Airport, is right there within uh, 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 20 minutes of uh, the Research Triangle area, just minutes of it. You've got numerous ag biotech companies. NC State's Centennial Campus is a real leader in public-private partnerships. Uh, North Carolina has 47,000 farms growing 90 different commodities and more than 400 different soil types. Uh, it is the perfect place for the relocation if it is to happen. And I just appreciate the ranking member for allowing me to make that quick plug. I have a statement for the record and, and some supporting document, uh, documents as well uh, that I'd like to submit for the record at the appropriate time. Thank you much. I yield back. Thank you. At this time, I'll recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Delgado. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank uh, each of the witnesses uh, for your testimony. Um, Ms. Brownlee, uh, last week I met with uh, my Agriculture Advisory Committee uh, in district to talk about issues impacting uh, farmers today. And one of the issues that we spoke about is climate change and its impact on soil health an ever-increasing problem for farmers, especially young farmers, uh, who will be dealing with a changing climate for decades to come. Uh, today, farmers in the Northeast and upstate New York, uh, where I serve, uh, Hudson Valley Catskills, as well as the Midwest, are weeks behind in planting. Uh, with such an urgent need uh, for research to help farmers adapt to and mitigate climate change, how would this move impact your ability to mitigate climate on your farm? Thank you, Congressman. Um, I think this move would hurt my ability to, rip, uh, to build my business. So climate change is one of our most pressing needs. Uh, we need research to address how are we going to adapt our farm? What trees should we be planting in our orchards? Um, how do we build soil health and sequester carbon um, over the next, yeah, three or four decades? And the reality is that if this agency, if these agencies move, their research is going to be delayed, which means that answers and policies are going to be delayed. And, and that means that it's affecting my bottom line because I can't respond as quickly if I don't have sound science to guide my decisions on my farm. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we are a month behind in grazing on our farm. We've had in, uh, unceasing rain this spring. So our animals are ready to go out to pasture and our grass was as tall as me actually right now, <laughs> ready to be grazed, but it's too wet. Mm -hmm. um, the grain farmers, the commodity farmers around me in Southern Indiana, it's the same. They're three plus weeks behind 
on um, planting because it's so wet, um, because the soils are just saturated. Mm. We've got to figure out how to respond to climate change. It's a problem right now. Mm. And we need NIFA and ERS working hard here in DC to, to make the, that research available to all of our farmers, not just in North Carolina or Wisconsin or Indiana. Um, I, you know, I'm not the primary stakeholder of either of these organizations. Um, the researchers who are doing the work and, and, and you all crafting the policy are. So I need, I need these groups here helping me adapt to climate change. I appreciate that. I don't have a lot of time, but I do want to squeeze in uh, one more question, Dr. Uh, Tracy, about the, the regional bias you talk about in your report. Um, you talk about how uh, the production across uh, the different parts of the country are different based on uh, the regional makeup of the climate in some regards, right? So can you speak a little bit more about uh, the potential for bias by taking uh, the agencies out of or these programs out of uh, Washington, D.C.? The, the big issue really is the perception of bias or, 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 or perceived bias in the sense that if these agencies are out, if they're in Madison and nearby the University of Wisconsin-Madison and um, folks will think that UW-Madison actually has more influence with, with the people who make the decisions about where the, the grants go. This is the biggest granting agency for agriculture. And um, people are people, and, and people are gonna say, oh, the, those Madison folks, they've got NIFA in their pocket. And, and I'm sure they wouldn't. I'm sure that wouldn't happen, but uh, that will be the perception and the jealousy. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Hartzler of Missouri, your time for questioning. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. And uh, I want to say that being from Missouri and uh, uh, an alma mater of University of Missouri, one of the land-grant universities in the Midwest, I wholeheartedly support this uh, move to, to bring these agencies out closer to the farmers, closer to the consumers. And I'm excited about what this can mean uh, for our, our country uh, and in general. Certainly we have a large pool of, of talented individuals. I have a letter here that I'd like to submit for the record that was received yesterday uh, from four of our land-grant universities, including the Iowa State University, University of Nebraska, Lincoln, Kansas State University, and the University of Missouri, in full support of this. And they point out in their letter that just since 2017, these institutions graduated more than 150 PhDs in agriculture. And there's no other location in the United States that offers such a similar a cluster of uh, diversity and, and uh, qualified employees. And I know that has been an issue here. And one of the reasons that the secretary wants to move this agency out is so that we can attract the talent uh, to the Midwest that will uh, be important for this mission. In the Midwest, we have over 400,000 farming operations with an average farm size of 600. Um, the Midwest also provides a uh, uh, savings of low cost, high quality of life, uh, convenient access to transportation, and it just is uh, a very positive uh, opportunity that we have. And I support what the Secretary is uh, doing and uh, look forward to ensuring that the USDA is the most effective, most efficient, and most consumer-focused agency in the federal government and trust that the USDA will support its existing future employees throughout the process moving forward. And uh, with that, I yield back and submit my letter. Thank you. Without objection, the letter is uh, submitted. Uh, this time, I'm Mr. Cox of California, your three minutes. Thank you so much, Chairman. Uh, public research is a vital partner for American agriculture, and even so much more so in my district, where the majority of specialty crops rely on public research and investment to be able to readily combat pests, disease, and address changing climate conditions. And so really, uh, for each one of the uh, witnesses here today, in your opinion, how can we best improve research agencies like ERS and EFA? I mean, is it through a relocation outside of Washington, uh, increased funding? And where should we as a subcommittee be focusing our efforts to improve agricultural research and best support your work? Let me start, okay. I think the best way that Congress can help solve these problems is to increase the AFRI budget. It's really uh, an embarrassment, I think, in our country today when food security is as challenging and threatening 
worldwide and, and to our own people that there's over uh, $42 billion in NIH budget to solve important things like cancer and heart disease. There's over $8 billion in NSF to for basic research, but just $440 million in AFRI to solve some of the biggest problems we're facing in the world. That's the issue. We should be spending money moving our major partner out of Washington where over 100 people, scientists, have already left the agency's morale is terrible. And it'll be years to get them back to where they are. Instead, we should all be working together to increase the funding for agricultural research that NIFA provides land-grant universities. Yeah, I'd like to add to that, and that would be my number one thing, is, is increasing the AFRI budget. Um, but I'll, I'll read from my report just very briefly, or my testimony. As reported in 2017, China has overtaken the United States as the top government funder of research. I've visited China many times over the last 15 years, and over that 15 years, the investment that they're putting in agriculture would, uh, is amazing. Um, building new universities, uh, Total campuses where they weren't, did not exist before are there now, and it's all about agriculture for them. And uh, we're falling behind, and they are a juggernaut, and they're coming uh, in terms of agricultural research, and, and we're falling back. I would also point out that um, in 2013, I was a grant panel manager um, for AFRI, and that year we received 170 pre-proposals we knew we could only fund seven grants. We told the, the folks who put in the pre-proposals that we could only fund seven. So we got 90 proposals, full proposals. We could still only fund seven. And, and we let many good grant proposals go by. I would just like to add that I need you to, beget, to invest in beginning farmers um, and carry out the promises to beginning farmers from the 2018 Farm Bill. Thank you. Um, just want you all to know that they have called votes, and I understand that there are quite a number of members that are going on CODELs immediately after the votes, so um, we're going to ask individuals to submit their questions for the record, um, and we will adjourn, but just wanted to leave with some quick closing remarks and allow my uh, the ranking member, if he has any, as well. Um, the hearing takeaways that I have at this time is that the proposal is not supported by the stakeholders. Um, individuals may, who are going to be in the areas where the research are, may be supportive of this, but generally, particularly small farmers, disadvantaged farmers, and those who need these agencies to be here in Washington, to be their voice, to be the research, to do the rapid re research, are concerned. Benefiting one state will disadvantage others, and all stakeholders depend on objective and parcel research. We should be fully staffing agencies, not increasing staffing losses through misguided relocations. Um, and I'm grateful to you all for your testimony, for being with us here this morning. Um, and Mr. Dunn, if you have any closing statements you'd like to make. Uh, thank you very much, Madam uh, Chair. Uh, I just want to respond to one comment I heard here today that uh, there won't be anybody left in D.C. to visit. Uh, that's, that's not true. The Secretary has already said the agency leadership will remain in Washington, D.C., and I encourage the Secretary to move forward uh, on his work and applaud his efforts. And with that, I, I yield back. Uh, as I stated earlier, the record will remain open for 10 calendar days for individuals to submit questions, uh, statements, and this meeting is adjourned, and we ask that you all have a pleasant afternoon.